the network. Oh, what's up, everybody? We're back with another link up, and today I'm linking up with Carolanka, made up of Rohan, Rohan, and AP. Yes, sir. But hey, man, like I have so much to say about these guys because I've seen so much progress. Have there's been touch bases over a matter of two years? You said basically two, yeah, two, two and a half. Two and a, yeah. First discovered them. Well, I wouldn't say discovered them. First linked up with them, talked to them um, a couple of years ago, and they were super early in their process, experimenting with a lot of things on streaming and all types of tactics. And now they've worked themselves up, grinding themselves up in, in an indie format. And from text, uh, text message marketing, which we will talk about and get heavy sure. into, um, from interesting networking tactics, and uh, a whole other lot of uh, details y'all get into y'all will it's definitely going to be a useful one um so definitely tune in stay stay tuned because you're going to get a lot of hard practical tactics and i know that's what y'all need as indies so you know rohan ap what's up man what's up man, what's up, man? this is dope to chop it up with you again yeah, man. first time we chatted was like i think you were doing your hour-long consulting calls <laughs> we just linked up there yeah, yeah that's we had like is. one song out <laughs> it's crazy <laughs> hey but y'all were y'all were learning and doing the, the way y'all spoke back then i knew that y'all were actually like y'all were approaching things from a scientific fashion which i would love for sure man that's yeah. why we vibe with your channel right yeah <laughs> yeah very tactical very very methodical right so yeah, I mean, I, and, and I mean, I, I love that approach because it's the only way to get real results if you want to do it yourself. And y'all actually spoke, so we'll, we're we're going to jump right into your text message marketing, right? For sure. Because speaking of those results and being practical from and scientific from that standpoint, y'all said that you did shows in rest inspired fashion, which meant y'all had no openers, so you can get the hard numbers like everybody is who's here they are here for me right 100 percent me about the importance um of that to y'all why did that in particular resonate with y'all and then we're going to talk about how y'all got the numbers that y'all got at shows right. yeah. well it's, it's good because i think that they tie into each other but i think for us like from day one like what we cared about is like the the philosophy of just depth over breadth you know like we're not really in it for like playlists are cool. Like all these, um, all these sort of top of funnel tactics are cool. But for me personally, like, I think there's so much fabrication on the internet, like so, so many things that, you know, are at the end of the day inflated. And even if they're not inflated, don't necessarily lead to like what we care about, which is, yeah, which is me. like, which is like real world results, right? Like being able to pull out people to an actual live show, like getting them out of their house and like coming to watch you. Like, I, I feel like we both vibe on that where it's like, that's a lot more important to us than the streams because those are like the those are the people who become the diehard fans you know they're not mm -hmm. just listeners at that point yeah and so like a lot of our a lot of our influences whether it's like tyler the creator or brock hampton or russ like whoever have employed this tactic of like everyone in the venue is there for them and having attended those shows as fans right just as fans of music to see the sheer difference in those shows where everyone is just saying every word and like there's this huge like in incredible community feel versus like you know there's like five or six artists in the bill and everyone's sort of like kind of engaged but they're talking to their homies and, and then they're like, like once they're once their homie who's like one of the openers like is done then like you they see <laughs> you see a drop off in the audience as well right like yeah and that's like that to me that's like a nightmare man because it's like i want y'all to like listen to me i don't want to be that annoying guy who's like speaking into a mic where it's like no one's actually like no one's actually there for the music they're just there to get drunk or whatever it is so for us it was very important from day one that we ensure that everyone was there for our music and everyone who's there was there for us and our brand yeah yeah 100 percent, man i mean that's definitely all those experiences i think most artists have either experienced or seen those especially yeah. you know those friends leave and hey, that's half of the show right that's that's yeah, a wrap yeah. all right and then that sucks but when you go through the experience of seeing as you say the people who are there for you understanding the hard numbers most importantly is the fact that now you know and i'm all about the fact that you can't take action on fake numbers right if you if you aren't real with yourself you're not going to be able to make progress and that's like an all-around 
philosophy for me. You have to be hard, like the hard truth, and now I can make progress, right? So if, if you guys know that y'all only got five people that came out, at least you know you got five people. For real, exactly. man. And I'll say, I'll say that it's like, yeah, my bad. Uh, I'll, say, I'll say that it's like what, before that first domino falls or that first show, it's a much tougher path because from this standpoint of like constantly people seeking validation and everything, it's like you might see lower numbers from like a streaming perspective or whatever because you're so focused on like the bottom of funnel and like creating those sort of super fans. Um, I think there's like that lack of validation, unfortunately, in a lot of ways where it's like you're not seeing like 100,000 monthly listeners or whatever it is that other people are looking for until you have until you actually hit that stage and they realize shit, people are like singing along to my music. Like there's no better feeling than that at the end of the day. Um, right. If I'm getting you clear, you're talking about the fact that, hey, I might have 500 followers and because I'm thin on my resources, I'm an indie, I don't have the ability to maybe work heavily on new people seeing me and increasing my relationship and frequency with the people who already know me. So right. it might look like 500, 501, 502, 505, 510, right? And over a long period of time, but in that time, I'm actually pushing people down the funnel so I can still yeah. get real results, right? Yeah. Exactly. It's like, how many of those 500 can we like actually For convert real. over time to become like actual fans of our music, right? Compared to just increasing the top of funnel, but then not getting enough people down yeah. to the bottom level. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about how you guys did that and right. the technologies you guys used. For sure. Yeah. So we'll, we'll get into SMS towards like that just recently became a thing because our manager like Cheyenne was pushing us on that heavy because he's like a commerce founder and that's big in the world of commerce and everything. But uh, I'll go back to like March 2019. Like, so basically for a while, like AP and I had the sort of vision statement where we were like, yo, we're going to play like the Mod Club in Toronto, which is a legendary club. Um, it's like weekend, like debuted there, like NAV, a bunch yeah. of like Toronto legends, obviously. And it's like a 650 cap room. And for the longest time, we were pushing off our show because we were like, yo, our first show is going to be at the since Mod like Club. Since like December 2017, right? <laughs> yeah, crazy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, since we knew, like talked to you. And, you know, it was really our manager who like shook us up and went like, yo, y'all are tripping. Like, if you can bring 80 people out to a show, bring 80 people out to a show. You need to experience what it's like to actually to get actually on stage, yeah. right? And that's when we were like, yo, like, like, let's pull the trigger. Like, why are we waiting? Like, we'll get there, but it's like, it's going to take 10,000 steps to get there, right? It's not like overnight, like you're at the mod club, like you don't have a label deal or anything that can like instantly grab, like push you there. And so that's when we were like, all right, let's start looking up like 80 to 100 cap venues in Toronto. And unfortunately, there really aren't any because like that's a very low cap, obviously. And like, it's not, it's not going to make a venue like a ton of money in terms of like bar sales or everything. So what we did is we found this DIY attic. It's, it's, an, it's called the it's attic. It's literally called the attic. It's uh, yeah, it's dope. It's called okay. the attic. And oh, you back? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so it's, it's called the attic in Toronto. And we went there and we rented out this like space like held by like i think it's like owned by like some not-for-profit and we like we built out the bar like we literally got a liquor license hired a bartender bought all the alcohol brought all uh, the sound equipment built built wooden, built our own stages wooden too. stages because there's no stages um obviously had to do all the audio and everything and the approach we took from a marketing standpoint was let's frame this let, let's ensure because we only have so much capacity every single person in there needs to be like super deep on our music and so what we did is for like a year and a half to two years, we actually kept a spreadsheet of every single person who had either DM'd us, messaged us, like d basically performed any action that would indicate that there was any fan. sort of interest. In like yeah. And so it's like every time we got like someone who either like posted a story and went like, yo, these guys are so fire. Like one of my favorite artists out or they DM'd us or literally anything. We put them down on the on spreadsheet. spreadsheet. And so when it came time for the show, we basically had like, you say on a spreadsheet. Was that just their Instagram profile? Was there any other data that you had around them? It, it started with Instagram because yeah. we weren't even doing email marketing at this point or nothing. It was all Instagram at this point, right? At yeah, I, I think it was all Instagram at that point. Yeah, yeah, all our folks said that. Yeah, and Facebook, a little bit of Facebook too. Yeah. Um, but it was, yeah, it was all that. And then when it came time for this, we were like, okay, let's frame this whole entire first show as basically almost like a, a public private event. So before it went on sale, we had basically already sold 50% of the tickets because the way we went about it is 
we like personally messaged every single person. We said, yo, so we're throwing this show. Unfortunately, capacity is very limited. So we want every single person to be in there to like, who's truly a fan to have a chance to get a ticket. So I'm gonna send you this ticket like, like early. And this is when that ticket link expires before it goes on public sale. And so like all of these people, because they had already expressed interest, they're already qualified leads in a lot of ways. They were like, yo, Let's get it. And they brought friends along. So before we even like announced the show, it was already 50% done. And then, you know, scarcity and all this stuff, like you announced that it's 50% sold out, more people buy. You say 75, then people are like, oh shit, people start panicking and they buy. So before we knew it, like we were able to like sell out to, to get that 80 person show, which is that first person, that, that first show. Um, and yeah, so the, the approach we took with that first show was just purely like let's let's frame this as like every single person in there needs to be like a diehard and that's that's what it turned out to be and i think like sort of framing it from a standpoint of like this is like almost like you guys get this exclusive chance to get in to the show like really helped it yeah and it's also like also um it's like that first show was a lot of also just tapping into our own networks um like just any first degree connections we had of people who we knew were supporting us along the way already and i think like at one point we had like a we were kind of reserved to that idea, but then mm. we realized the value of like, wait first, like before we even jump into getting new people into the funnel, let's think of the people we already have in our networks and then let's tap into our own networks first and then we can use our network to grow even larger, right? So um, I think a lot of that first show came down to that as well. How do y'all reach out to those people that first time around with this does through DM? Yeah, DM. Yeah, DM mainly. Uh, for the very for the people who like we're very close with, obviously like text message or whatever. Um, but that that's like the low hanging fruit. But like for fans whose like numbers and whatnot, we didn't have like all DM. Just all, all DM. DM. Yeah. How much was it per ticket? It was not that much, man. It was ten dollars per ticket, yeah. which a lot of lessons learned from that because you know the lower your ticket price is, the more likely people are. Some people won't show up. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, but that was that was the first show, ten dollars per ticket. Yeah, I had to learn that through free events, right? You think, hey, oh man, you know, <laughs> let's make it free and everybody is gonna come. Nope, nope. Yeah, you know, because there's not enough holding them to that commitment, right? No, at that not. point, exactly. So. No, nah, man. Okay. I get it. And I, I love to see that you guys did do that beforehand. It's always about whenever it comes to shows, especially when you're working as heavy as possible from an indie perspective, it's always about how many can I create without, you know, overdoing it. But even on a larger scale, there people are still creating tr triggers. Coachella puts out the tickets six months beforehand. Right. You know, they're still as sold out as those shows are. They're still essentially early birds right mm -hmm. and there's a reason for that you need them and to see that you guys are starting to execute you'll just be doing the same thing over and over and over again you have and, and we'll, we'll get into that like yeah. for the third show which was obviously 250 cap like way above the first show and second show um that that's something we had to employ is just like the idea of like pre-sale and the, like different tiers yeah. of like pricing and everything um yeah so that was that was the first show and that was that was in march went very well it was great um, sorry, my bad. Do, say? do this text match, uh, messaging marketing. What's that? When did y'all start doing the text message marketing? Yeah, marketing? yeah. So, okay. So basically, I'll actually get the emails. I mean, the yeah, text. So Eventbrite, like the ticket sales help getting the emails, obviously like make that a mandatory thing. The second show that we did was basically a repeat of the first show, except with a hundred new unique people. Cause there were enough people that basically were like, yo, this looks crazy. Like I missed out. Like, please let me know the next time you have one. And so those people, like we had a hundred new people for the second show, which was great growth, but same venue and everything. Um, just like 20 more people basically. And then video of that first one. What's up? So you had video for that first one. Exactly. Yes. Like that's, I think that's where we really utilized uh, social media was like just making sure we got content from that first one and we posted it and also just like user generated content. Like anyone yeah. who was there, like posted stories. And I know like friends of people who came to our show were reaching out to us and being like, yo, this looked really like this looked crazy. Like when are you guys having another one? And then, then what we ended up doing is actually we built another spreadsheet with like a brand new people until we hit that hundred number. And then we're like, yo, we can, we can definitely do this. I think, yeah, the, like it was the whole first 24 hours after that first show was like us messaging people and being like, yo, send us all the videos you have before they expire on Instagram stories. Cause we need every single video. Um, so that was, that was very important. Like those having those assets for sure. You guys should, if people, when people 
send those, you guys should also record, screen record those videos as stories as well. Yeah. Just mm-hmm. so it can like story and, and act as social proof later. Um, yeah. Having those compilations of social proof and putting those into one long video is just a reusable asset. You can use that to market shows. Uh, you guys at least have that those videos that you already have um, from people sending direct to. Just having those as stories as well because it then shows people, like you can have your pre, right? This beautiful produced video you put together, but now this is social proof from, from different angles. Yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's a beautiful thing man it's a beautiful thing it's crazy like what effect that has on it like actually having a show and then like showing it in real life yeah like, what effect that has psychologically on people who are like now i want to come out the second time or third time it's insane man so yeah so that the sms stuff uh came in the third time around so we had our first show march um 2019 second show july 2019 and then mm-hmm. we were really gearing up we were like yo we want to like basically make the like we want to wrap it up with three shows this year. Third one, we wanted to hit 250 as the cap. And so what we did here is we knew we had to, obviously like there were people uh, who were like, yo, I want to like similar to the second show, like, yo, I, I saw the other ones I want to come out, but we realized for us to hit that cap, we were really going to put in, we had to put in some work from a standpoint of, um, I guess like the multiplication effect for sure. Like getting people who had already experienced the show to come again and bring at least one friend or two friends or whatever it is. And then also like the idea of like doing things that don't scale. Um, So what was important there was we took this approach where basically for all of our super fans who had already been to a show, we told them, yo, um, our brand is, it's, it's corny as fuck, but the music bangs. That's like the tagline of our brand. All right. So we framed it as like, yo, if you've been to a Karolanka show before, you're a cornball. But for us to like sell the show out, <laughs> for us to sell the show out, we need to like bring new kernels in. Like we need kernels. We don't like, we need corn balls, but we need kernels too. <laughs> it's hella corny, man. Hey, man. It's corny corn- with music bands. <laughs> <It's> cor- <laughs> He's cringing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, so we were basically like selling our super fans on, yo, we need to hit this goal together. Cause this is like the Carolanka universe. This is like, we're one big like cornball family. Like we, we need y'all to like help us hit this goal. And so we need you guys to bring kernels, people who've never been to a Carolanka show before. Yeah. What we did is <laughs> we, we basically equipped our super fans. What I mean by that is we actually made personalized invites for anyone that they message us with, like anyone's names. Um, who would possibly want to come to a show to give them the extra push. You can you mind pushing, pulling up like a wall of fans. Yeah. So basically it's what we did, right? Is we have this thing at our shows called the wall of fans. And it's like, it's a lot of work, but for us, it's like super important. It's basically like we take our album covers, sorry, our single covers and we Photoshop every single one of our fans faces on there. And so, so like, like, this is a, one of our single covers with um, a, fan's a fan's face on it. No. All right. So we basically, what we did is we created a bunch of those for people. Our super fans would be like, yo, I want to bring like 10 people. Here's all their names and here's their photos. And we're like, all right, cool. And then we'd send them like basically that as like a personalized invite. And so when people got that, they'd be like, yo, dope. Like I'm trying to, I'm trying to come through this show. And that's essentially how we sold out the third show was the multiplication effect, but also like also the level of personalization we went into, like, um, cause also like we also ended up filming, uh, we we incorporate skits into our live shows. So what we ended up doing is actually we filmed a personalized skit invite on IG that we would send to like each one of these people right. on um, which list was that for? Um, the 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 skit invites. The skit invites? Oh, you're talking about like the pre-sale? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. That yeah. that's for everyone who had come to a show before. That was yeah, yeah, yeah. For everyone who had come to a show before, like we sent them like literally every single person got a personalized invite for the pre-sale, which was crazy. And so, um, so when they, when they went to checkout, going back to SMS marketing, uh, we now made it a mandatory field at checkout to also do SMS. Yeah. Um, so they had to put in their number in order to like actually go through the checkout. And so when that happened, that's when we got super phone and started like building out the CRM from that perspective. And then leading up to the show, we basically started to send like nurture them and like be like, yo, this is a playlist with all our music, like get hyped. Cause this is way more fun. If you sing along to all the lyrics and people are like, yo, I'm gonna listen to this. And we could see the plays going up on Spotify, which is beautiful. Um, and then we'd be like, yo, this is like what you This is the time you arrive at, like be pumped, like just giving them more context so that when they arrived at the venue, like even the new people, 
who were like colonels, like they would even they're, they're sort of entering with so much context that like the actual event itself like felt dope as fuck. Um, and then yeah, so that was tight. And then how we incorporate it into the actual show itself. Show itself. Yeah. This was the interesting way in which we got numbers like a, a more creative approach to it yeah because because real quick like a, a, like so let, let's say like you have like a cornball who's buying a ticket for three other people right like like someone who's been to a show before and they're bringing three friends they're only going to put their number in so we only get one number out of four numbers because they'll just copy and paste their numbers sometimes so it's like how do we our thing was like how do we get the other three numbers right? yeah so what we ended up doing was um just for like a bit of context the show our last show was a it, there was an election theme behind it um, so basically what we did is during one of our skits, we framed it as a, um, like, uh, we need you as our fans to vote on who you want to and be your president, to be your president. <laughs> right. And, uh, basically we put up the, our, uh, super phone number on the screen. And actually the craziest part was like, we didn't know how well it would work. We had a feeling it would work, but we were backstage while the skit was playing because yeah. Rohan pulls up his phone and literally as soon as the number goes up, like I've never seen notifications come in like that fast before. It was crazy. Uh, but like that's, that's like just using the power of live and finding ways to capture info through things that feel like they're part of the experience, not just like, hey, give yeah. me a number, but like, that's, that's hey, a there's really, a reason why yeah. we need your number, right? Because, because yeah, I think it's like, if you're, if you're just going to be like, give me your number so I can text you, it's like, okay, that's not enough value at the end of the day, right? But if it's like, you're gamifying it, and it's like, yo, there's this, there's a larger purpose behind it, and you're part of an experience, like people are a lot more, I think, just willing to, yeah, do that. Yeah. No, it's a fact. I mean, two things I want to make sure aren't missed is one, the level of detail that you guys paid attention to things and how much work that took. So when people say, yo, man, I can't do this or I'm, I'm, or I've been grinding or I keep trying, or, like there's so much work that goes into this. I don't think most people can understand the context. We really can't de describe it so they can understand it. And yeah. unless you've just done that type of stuff before to that level. And I have, so I understand that you guys put a lot of work into it. So I appreciate that y'all have done that because it's, it not, it's not even just the work itself, the thought that goes behind it. That stuff doesn't just from, hey, all right, I'm gonna set this up and oh, do you feel like you put these triggers in, in place? Now there's so much creative thought to make everything contextual, to make it effective. One um, guy, I, I remember you guys maybe think about a guy I um, did some work for maybe two or three years ago, but he had this music video where he was, um, it was this whole thing where it was a, a, a guy who had a new girlfriend and she, he had a crazy ex-girlfriend, right? Mm -hmm. Pretty simple. He was still working on the video. It was supposed to be All right, but yep. what's the last thing you guys heard? Uh, we heard uh, something about the thought, the thought behind it. Oh no! Oh, the, no, no, the, the, the music, music video, video. You were talking about the there was the girlfriend and then the crazy ex. All right, cool. Yeah, so we'll figure out how to edit this. Yeah. But, um. All right. So, yeah, he had this music video idea. So the music video actually wasn't complete yet. Right. But we already had the concept, and it, and it was already underway. He had the show. And what I had him do was in mid show, say, hey guys, I have this cool music video, stop, have this interaction with the crowd. And one of these girls is gonna be the crazy ex, right? One of these <laughs> girls is gonna be nice. you know, my new girl, provided context around that and had them go on their phones and vote, right? Which one did you think okay. was the crazy ex That's and which one did you think was, is the, you know, the new chick or whatever. And of course, as you guys experience a huge boost, right? Like you don't ever eat in a short period of time, yeah. but it's always about context. People ask for too much without giving a reason to, and it always comes back to when we try to give general advice. Yes, you can say, oh, collect emails, collect text messages, collect all these things is really meaningless people think oh man you're just saying the same thing and it's bluff well you can't get too much detail uh much more detail without having context, context the exactly because exactly. it might be derived from a song it might be revived derived from your brand as all like who knows what you have going on with it 
So I love that you guys were able to figure out something that was contextual to y'all, made sense, and actually worked with the relationship you had with your audience. So, um, and that was show number three, right? That's that show, number, show three. number three, yeah. That's show number three. Dope, dope. Nice build up. And what if, when you got those text messages, have you guys leveraged that much outside of shows? Because I know you said you send a, something a week, one text a week. We do a text blast once a week uh, to everyone on our list. And we do we do two things with text. Like basically, we do that one text blast. So there's like we think about it as like some like one text blast a week from us to them, and then like we also give them an opportunity once a week to text us. I mean, obviously, if they just randomly text us, we're gonna text them. But like scheduling wise, we also have this thing called oh you you're gonna die. It's called Corn Hub. <laughs> it's it's <been. laughs> <laughs> he's like yo i can't take y'all right <laughs> it's, it's not what you think it is all right <laughs> the whole idea is we beat it up in front of you but not it's not what you think it's basically we make we make <laughs> we wait, 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 let us explain let we'll us explain, explain. We'll, i promise it'll make sense context it's all about context context man <laughs> we make we make a beat on ig live in 15 minutes but we make a beat using rules that our fans text us so a fan might be like yo <clears throat> I want you to like sample a Star Wars like theme song or something like that. And there's three rules. And basically we give them the opportunity to text us as well. And so there's two like basically te like larger text touch points per week is that's one. And then we do like a general text blast on the Saturdays as well, which it, it, it tends to, it's not always like, yo, we have a new song that's dropped. Like sometimes it'll be yeah, like, yo, we don't want to ask too much either. Right. Mm -hmm. So about, again, it just comes down to like delivering some sort of value. Um, yeah whether that's as simple as like, hey, what are you guys listening to this week? This is what we've been listening to this week, or this is what's on our playlist. Um, and it's like, it's about like, not always just pushing your own music, but like also just like- Nurturing. Yeah. Yeah. Just building those relationships really. Yeah. Um, I mean, cause now you guys have the opportunity to put them on to some music they haven't heard before. And then that's well, exactly. strong thing to remember. Right. Exactly. And, and it feels, it, it doesn't feel transactional, right? Because, and I think because of the natural, the other thing is like for us, like that's dope. Like the fact yeah. that we get to like our fans are our friends and we get to like have genuine conversations with them. That's dope. Like maybe for a lot of artists, like that doesn't feel genuine. Like I see a lot of like larger artists who are like, text me now. And it's like sort of just like a bot texting back for us. It's not really about that. Like we, we like having genuine interactions and conversations with our fans as it gets bigger, obviously it'll be harder, yeah, but right now we can. At that point you got to scale. But like, again, like I guess the theme of like a lot of what we're talking about today is just when you're at a smaller level, it's a, a lot of it comes down to just doing things that don't scale. Right. Just finding those creative ways to personalize. Yeah. yeah. What tech software do you guys use? Superphone. Cool. Yeah. And Hmm. And you guys wouldn't say it's expensive for y'all. I mean, I know you guys aren't like, I know you guys aren't way up here as artists, right? Financially. And yeah. I know you guys probably aren't the, the, you know, just on the streets as well. Yeah. But generally speaking for you, based on a typical artist budget, all the things you guys have to pay for the, the, you, obviously I, I think you guys think it's worth it um, based on how y'all use it. Cause you have to let you leverage, but do, would you call it, would you say it's generally expensive for you? It's, it's variable, right? Like it's like, as it scales, it's going to get more expensive, but as it scales, you have the more opportunity to sell like merch to more customers. So it just like makes sense, like from a standpoint of like scaling for us, it's like, if you can't afford to like take like, let's say $50 a month out of your like uh, Facebook ads budget or something else to have this deep level of connection with your fans, then it probably isn't right for you, you know, because for me, it's like, it's much more effective than like nurturing through like retargeting on Facebook because it's like you have a direct line with these fans. Like the private yeah. channel is just so effective. And so for us, it's like, it's a no brainer. Like it can run like, uh, yeah, it can run like 50 bucks a month sometimes, but it's, it's totally. It's I also think. about like just owning the means of communication, right? That's something a lot yeah. of our managers actually just like just talk to us about. And like, he'd always be like, you know, like Facebook could shut down, Instagram could shut down, but like it's when you have, when you go through text or email, it's like th those things are going to last, you know what I mean? So it's like, no matter what you have that information to like, even if something else shuts down, you have the, that direct to consumer. Yeah. Um, like that's Ryan Leslie's whole philosophy as a founder, right? Is like data ownership. And yeah. That's, that's like just so important to us. It's like, it might not be leading to like um, likes or any type of public validation, but it's something much stronger, which is just like individual one-to-one 
sort of um, relationship building with their fans. But yeah, no, I wouldn't say it's expensive. Like from my perspective, like 50 bucks a month max, like right now at our scale with like 200 numbers. Um, yeah. Got you. Okay. Well, I want to go back for a second to the yeah. corn hub situation. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Give me an idea of like paint the picture a little bit more in terms right. of what you guys exactly are doing that whole the beat and the fans can actually text you how do you even prime them and let them know hey you can text me during this time because to me it sounds like you're saying hey you i had you have my text message but don't come texting me anytime just about random stuff uh, you guys have figured out a way to control it um i'm sure they do text you random stuff at times but it sounds like you guys are creating a way where you you want to allow them feel, to feel like they can text something and there's a useful for a two-way conversation, mm -hmm. but you don't want it to be completely open where it's right. completely informal. Um, like, honestly, at the scale we're at, we're, we're okay with it being completely open, just to clear that up. Like, if, if our fans, like, text us out of nowhere, like, we're totally fine having a conversation with them. I, I guess I met, more so meant, like, formally, like, the formal touch points are, like, twice a week, like, with the uh, once, like with the corn hub stuff on Thursdays and then the um, Saturday like text blast. Um, like what we do is we'll go on Instagram stories and uh, we've started to try and experiment with TikTok, but that's a bit harder because like you're getting people, for the most part, you're getting people who aren't as nurtured, but like mainly like Instagram stories and be like, yo, this is our, this is our number right here. Like text us a rule and you have the chance for this rule to be picked. We're picking three random rules this week. Um, these are some examples of like, fans who have like actually got the rule picked last week and they're hella excited just sort of showing that like social proof that it is possible you know what i'm saying and then and then from there like people are usually like just happy to text in and be a part of the creative process nope so and you guys will say since you really focus on this part of strategy because you know obviously you've tried a lot of other tactics right but when you talk about the show strategy and then adding in sms how long have you been working that to get from zero to nurtured list and the 250 people show that's based all on you guys? And is that still a ten? Sorry, is that still a what? At ten dollars a person. No, oh, so that's a good point. No, so the first show is ten dollars. The second show is fifteen. This this show is twenty two dollars per ticket. Twenty two dollars and two hundred fifty people. Yeah, yeah. I love it. I yeah. love it. This, I love dude. Dude, making it for us to like have that little bit of gratification, like side point for us, because we lost money on the first two shows because of the venue and everything it was just so DIY. But like for us to like go into that third show and be like, fuck, like we walked away with money, regardless of how much money it is, even if it's equivalent to like one or two paychecks, my old job, like amazing feeling. Yeah. And that, that as an artist that can keep you going for like an entire year, man. <laughs> yeah. I get it. Like, look, 50, what, 22, you said? 22 times 250, 5,500, right? Yeah. And that's far more than the nothing that so many people make just oh, to get exactly. the show, right? Let alone to be able to do that alone. That's a strong number. And I know you're now at the point, well, you probably did this when you made twenty dollars and fifty dollars but now you see five thousand five hundred holy shit if i double this yeah right and i keep and hope exactly this, right <laughs> you already have a system that's what i like what you got what you guys are doing and i try to explain to people right it's just, just getting these random results they're cool but you guys have a level of certainty where you just say okay when are we going to do it again versus what do I do? How did I do what I did? All right. So it's, it's yeah. a really cool space to be in. And I want I don't, before we move on, I want to make sure we actually um, like don't skip out on this. So that question I asked, how long has that been though? Yeah. Since you guys were really committed to that process? March to December, 10 months. Um, so that would be like, I guess, I guess it's coming up on a year now since we did our first show, which was March 2nd, I believe. Yeah. March 2nd. Yeah. Uh, Three shows in 10 months. Yeah, yeah. All right, before you guys started the, the so when, when you say March, is that when the first show was? Yeah, that was March show, 2019, yeah. yeah. All right, when did you start marketing that show? Uh, February, early a month, Feb, a month before? Like a month and February, a half, yeah, a month. February 2019, yeah. A month 
so February. And now when you guys started marketing that show, probably how many Instagram followers, how many Spotify normal listeners did you guys project that you had at that time? Not that many, man. Like, and to be honest, not that many now either, yeah. but, but, but like probably like, um, like followers wise, probably like just about like 900 or something. Like I think that? so. Like think 900. Yeah. 900. And, uh, Spotify, fo- like Spotify listeners. I think at that time it was maybe around 2000. 2000 yeah, yeah so but that's because like because of playlist placements. oh because yeah we had more playlist placements before than we had now so it was at 2000 uh before yeah 2000 monthly list yeah yeah before yeah but like i feel like that really goes to show is just like this like, is this playlists, is <laughs> like like spotify numbers can be inflated but like like right now our monthly listeners are, are lower, lower than it was when we did our first show but that's just because of playlist placements at the time, right? And it just really goes to show that like sometimes those numbers can be inflated due to other factors, but like our live numbers have grown, right? Yeah, because before we were also experimenting with like, you know, like playlist placements and like uh, all that stuff. Um, and it's, it's really tough to see, like you can look at save rates and all this stuff for sure, but it's like, to be honest, like a lot of like these shitty playlist scam companies have gotten really good at even like gaming that like they'll legitimately like get bots to save your, like they know artists are looking at that. So they'll be like, Oh, get at least 10% of the bots to save your thing. Right. And it's, it's so for us, it's like, we've actually let it taper off. And now we know that like every single person who is listening on Spotify is actually listening. They're real people. Um, but that you're right. Like that goes to show that it's more so about the percentage of people that we've captured and less about the top of funnel. What's your monthly listeners now? Uh, thir- it's, it goes between 1200 and 1400. All right, perfect. Yeah, I, I definitely just wanted to make sure we got the numbers and walked all the way throughout that process. Sure. Yeah. Even, even at 2000, right? Mm-hmm. Just so people know, they didn't start, at a, you guys didn't start a huge number. No. And you just worked the process all the way to this end result. Exactly. There are, really bro, cool there, there are people with a hundred thousand listeners who, Oh, in my bad. There are people with a hundred thousand listeners who can't do a hundred person venue. You know what I'm saying? Because like you get on new music Friday, like one week. What's up? I say you're getting in your rust bag. I'm getting my <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, for real, for real. Yeah. No, but, uh, but in seriously as well, when you talk about those pre-saves and how smart a lot of the people who are gaming the system are at making the things look like that, I, it really saddens me at some point sometimes because I've had conversations where, you know, to be honest, like our artists might want to hire me for a marketing situation. Right. And they'll, they'll be explaining all these things that they have going on for them and I'll say, hey, well, we can do this and this. And they'll be like, no, no, I don't need that. I'm good. Like those numbers you're giving me are lower than the numbers that I have. And <laughs> like, ah, you don't know that these numbers are fake, do you? It's like, oh yeah, but then, you know, but I got great engagement and all that stuff. It's like, no, like they can fake engagement too, right? They can yeah. fake likes too. Like it's not just the like all those aspects and and you can tell it's like it just doesn't a lot of a lot of artists are just living in a dream world man and we have to like pull ourselves out of that like it's like there's only one thing that matters and that's why like we double down on this because like you don't have bodies in the room like you ain't shit in my opinion (laughs) that's it you know i I mean at the end of the day you have that and you know that is for sure right unless they're exactly Somebody scamming you with fucking holograms in the room. For real, man. <laughs> Bu- buying people off the street. To like, hey, and by, and by the way, by the way, that's why Spotify just took away like the 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 number of listeners that you can you can't see the number of listeners on the playlist tab anymore, right? It's like they they've realized that they've like indirectly created this sort of broken ecosystem. So yeah, yeah. I mean, there's so many ways, man. So yeah, artists definitely be aware that you can have a complete 360 scam going on that looks great from all these angles and like, don't, don't, don't fall into that trap for real because, like, i've seen it all the way into the detail where there have been people that have had all this great engagement great content um comment content no comments and everything yeah and oh man i gotta reach out to this guy because we refer he was the one who asked me about it and started to investigate but essentially he reached out to some of the guys who were commenting on that person's videos yeah. was about the artist and the people were like, who the hell is this? Who? Man. Like, 
Damn. My profile essentially was used to comment on somebody else, right? That's the, like the example. It wasn't my profile, but used to yeah. comment, comment on somebody else. And I don't even know that I'm out here commenting on all these other people's profiles, mm-hmm. right? They, they took my stuff. And now if someone asks, oh man, I saw your comment on such and such artist or such and such page. And like, I don't even know who that is. But the artists themselves, now they can see, oh snap, Brandman Sean is a fan of me and he's definitely a real person, right? It looks, so how can you convince them if they just don't understand how fake this stuff is and then you already have the delusion and some of that stuff that comes with being an artist and thinking you're awesome, period, right? Like, you know, it's a Yes, and break it's a that more philosophical issue too around like how we like what type of success do we prop up as as like a community of, or society of artists in general right it's like we put the wrong things on the pedestal at the end of the day like we're not necessarily like like we're putting things like instagram followers and likes and like all this shit on a pedestal when really what we should be putting on a pedestal is like are you building a fucking fan base or not right yeah that's that's what it is yeah yeah yeah, man. This conversation makes me think. I'm about to, I'm gonna hit an artist up. Have a heart to heart, man. It's like you don't need to work with me. You, you need to, to. You need to have some honest conversations sometimes, man. <laughs> What's going down? Um, look, 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 well, let's do this. I want to talk about your networking situation and how you guys were able to get in contact with YB and Corday's manager. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. Um, yeah. So basically, this this uh, has a funny story, actually. So, like, basically, like, we we make our own music, but we also produce, and like, it's you know, we're inspired by like Kanye, Ryan, Leslie, like all these guys who sort of have this sort of double edged sword where they make their own music, but just as great as they write songs for other people and produce songs for other people. So that's definitely something that we want to do, and that that should that we want that to be part of our legacy. And so I was going to the YBN Corday show. <clears throat> AP and I meet up like four or five times a week, just like work on music. And I'd gotten like the day before the show, I got this like email basically. And it said like, your meet and greet package with YBN Corday comes with this, this, this. And I'm like, I didn't even get a meet and greet package. This is crazy. But then I was like, fuck, if I'm getting a meet and greet, like what am I, I doing? I'm going to make something happen. Right. And so <laughs> we just sort of like hopped on like a group call. This is back when I worked at like when I was working my nine to five too. So I just like hopped into like you know, a meeting room real quick, like had a quick conference call with like AP and like our manager and everything. We're like, yo, what can we do that's like unique to get his attention? Uh, AP came over that night. We basically like just did some research and we like figured out that he was hella into um, like Yu-Gi-Oh, Yu-Gi-Oh, Pokemon, like just anime in general. And so we were like, yo, like, let's not just go up to him and give him a USB. Cause bro, he's yeah. going to like slap that shit out of our hands and be like, get the fuck like, out Let's not pull the like, Here's like 10 beats card, right? Yeah, like, no, nah. it's, it's just not going to work that way. And so, uh, so we're like, yo, let's think of a unique way to, it's about framing it right. And so we realized because he's super into Yu-Gi-Oh, I was just like, yo, I think actually AP said this as a joke. Cause we're corny. Like we like, we like just cracking dad jokes and shit. He was like, he was like, yo, we, <laughs> he was like, yo, we should, we should make him the YBN core deck. And I said it as a joke. He I said just, it <laughs> like, I just, I was like, joke. but I was like, bro, stop. This guy looked at me like, that's <laughs> that's genius like that's genius and then i was like Yu-Gi-Oh cards right and so what we did is like while ap was working on the beats and mixing and mastering them that night we were up until like 5 a.m that night it's crazy i was just like photoshopping his face onto these Yu-Gi-Oh cards basically and yeah you can yeah, show I'll, I'll pull up yeah why don't we pull up yeah. like the Yu-Gi-Oh card real quick real quick like this is one of him on obelisk if y'all know so, obelisk if you know about Yu-Gi-Oh, you know then you know obelisk the tormentor yes sir that's yeah. So these cards, basically what we did is I, I went and I printed these cards out the next day. Cause I was going to the show. AP wasn't with me, but I, we put QR codes on these cards, which basically the QR codes would lead, like if you scanned it would go to a SoundCloud link and it would basically um, like th- those are the beats basically. Um, and so I get to the venue and lo and behold, the security guards, like anyone who got an email about meet and greet, it's a, it, it was a glitch. You're not getting meet and greet. So now I'm like, shit, like, what are we going to do? Just put all this work into this. It's like, Fuck. you got to get to it. You know? Yeah. And you know how venue people be like, you're going up to the bartender security and they're like, I don't give a shit, bro. I don't give a shit if you need to get this to him. Like, that's not my job. I'm like, all right, whatever. I'm just in the crowd real quick. And, and I'm like, I'm with like five of my boys. So I'm like, guys, I'm going to tweet this real quick. I need this tweet to go viral. So I need you guys to share this with like every single one of your like WhatsApp groups. And then everyone needs to start tagging YBN Corday. Cause I did the calculation. He gets like, 
uh, like 50 mentions in an hour. So I was like, yo, if we can get him like 20 mentions in like 10 minutes, like he's going to see it for sure. And he's backstage and everything. So I took a photo of like the Yu-Gi-Oh card deck and I was like, yo, we made this for you. Like, like I'm in the, I'm in the crowd. They won't let me into like meet and greet. What's up? He saw it within 10 minutes. And then he was like, yo, my man's about to DM you. We linked up with his manager. He like took it, which is like, obviously like we chopped it up real quick. Now has YBN Corday hopped on one of our beats? No, no. But if I'm being real with you, like, it's, we don't necessarily look at this. Like I'm thinking, I'm thinking six, Long seven, term. I'm thinking 10 years, man. I'm not thinking like, like, you know, like why didn't he use one of our beats? I'm thinking like we're cre- crafting this relationship with someone who's obviously like killing it in the game and like coming up. And to be honest, like probably even more valuable is like connecting with his manager. Because if we ever need to connect with like a booking agent, shit, I hope he doesn't watch this. But if we, if we ever need to like connect with a booking agent or something and like we need that intro, like, hopefully he got us right or someone else or whatever it is and so he came back actually like he really like he loved the he loved the yugo cards he put it on his story and everything which was dope um then when they came back this was even more important they came back again uh six months later recently he opened for logic um and at that show we were like yo we have to like follow up because the follow-up is just as important like that's how you build a relationship you can have like the first touch point but the first touch point doesn't mean shit if you just like drop off. And so we made him Harry Potter cards, but this was what was really important. We made cards for every single one of it, like everyone in a circle. So we made cards for his producer, yeah, for his engineer research. and his manager. Cause those are the people that matter, man. Like yeah. YBN Corday is getting like, he's getting a million messages a day. These guys, they're doing just as much work, but they're not necessarily getting this. So like when we hit them up, they're like, yo, we appreciate you for thinking of us, right? And we met up with like all of them, gave them the cards. And now like where it's at now is like, we just hopefully have good relationships with them. How did you get their attention the second time? What's that? How did you get their attention the second time? Uh, so I have like notifications like on Insta of like whenever they go live or anything like that. And <laughs> I don't know if I can say, I can probably say this, it's fine. Like, so they, they went live, like uh, Cam, his manager and like his producer on the tour bus. And they're like, yo man, we're just, bruh, like we're, there's no weed out here. Like this fucking Washington's boring as fuck. And I'm like, yo, y'all are in Toronto, right? Like I got y'all on that loud <laughs> Like when you come here. <laughs> and I just said it as a joke or whatever, but that he was like, yeah. And then they were like, oh shit, that's the Yu-Gi-Oh card guy. Yo, yo, link me up, link up, link up. And I already had Cam's number. So I texted him. Cam's the manager. Cam's the manager. Sorry. I texted him and, uh, you know, linked up with them, like, uh, gave them the cards. I, I showed them the cards and they were like, yo, dope. Um, how I reached out to the, oh, sorry, this is really important. My bad. Skipped over this detail, but we had a direct line with Cam, but like, you know, the producer didn't know us. The engineer didn't know us. These other guys obviously didn't know us. Um, and so we emailed them also, like we emailed them, like we planned it out so that a week before the show, we were like, yo, come link with us in like Toronto in a week, we have these for you. And we sent that to the engineer and the producer. Cause we knew that if this guy didn't respond, at least this guy would respond and this guy could get everyone else the cards. Like mm-hmm. it was basically like hoping that like one of them, at least would, one of them. Yeah. One of them would be the gateway at least, but, and it turned out great because all of them responded, but like, we just had that sort of in mind to bulletproof it. Dope. Dope. Yeah, I mean, I love it. I mean, it, once again, it's, it's thoughtfulness and it's detailed. And, and a, a big thing, like when you guys first mentioned the Yu-Gi-Oh card thing to me, it's so funny because I tell people this all the time that I get business cards and artist cards, like a, any kind of business, let alone artists, right? Yeah. And I try to actually keep, um, you know, a healthy amount of them. And especially if I'm talking to somebody and try to follow up or something, but also, it comes that time where I have to get rid of cars, right? It's like, it's, look, I don't want them, or I just have to clean stuff out. Yeah. Every single time that I've cleaned stuff out over the last, it's probably been, let's say, eight months at this point, there's this one card that I have not thrown away, and I refuse to, and it's an a artist who basically made his car in a Yu-Gi-Oh style, right? Oh, nice. So... Like I just, and it wasn't like, and that wasn't even about me. Photoshop, like I just thought yeah. it was dope. like it looked, it nope. looked dope. I love the attention to detail. I love Yu Gi Oh. So it's like, it's like, man, you know, I, I gotta, I appreciate this. You know what I mean? So, like, yeah. it, it, it's so funny how people are unaware at those small details having a huge impact. For real, man. For it's, real. it's, uh, you yeah. know, I think about it. It's like, again, yo, this is our whole philosophy is like do things that don't scale. Right. So it's like, if you put in 
an extra 10% of effort than everyone else, you will get 20 times the results. That's what it is. Like, yeah, and that's a little bit of a misnomer, man. I think it, it sounds good to say think, do things that don't scale. Mm -hmm. But the funny thing is when people say do things that don't scale, they typically result in do things that make an impact. And impact scales better than anything else. Sure. Right? Well, yeah, that's just, true. It's a good way to look at it, actually. Yeah. It just you know, it's below ground for a while. Right, but overall, we know what it does, and we know it has a greater effect. So I, I definitely love the fact you guys do that. Oh, it's, it's, it's one more thing, of course, that we we need to touch on because you've mentioned it a few times in in one way or another throughout uh, this call, which is um, quitting your job. All right. Yeah. Um. Are you? For real, for real, I work no job at all, or do you just not work your old job and, and now you're doing things that take less commitment? And yeah, it, for it, me. And is it AP too, or just you? No, so, yeah, things. yeah. Yeah, I'll no, start. so AP, AP, yeah, I actually start. Go yeah, I'll start. Yeah, so like actually after I graduated in 2016, um, I was like, yo, I'm going to move back home. And um, where's back home? Back home was like an hour away from where my campus was, but like basically I'm like with my parents right now. We're we're in we're in Toronto, like we're we're in the greater Toronto area. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Still still in Toronto. Okay, got, yeah, it, yeah. got it. And um, I was like, you know what? I'm gonna move back home, and I'm gonna I'm just gonna go all in on music, right? And that's when we linked up and all that. Um, and then like for a long time, like I was being supported by my parents. I still am. And then um, right now though, like I'm I'm now trying to find ways to like just make money through the things I've learned over the, over the past, like what, three years now, almost four years. Nope. Um, so like, that's where I'm at right now. Beat store. Yeah. Engineering, yeah. Like beat that. store engineering, like just offering yeah. the services that I've learned. And like, now I feel like I'm at a level where it's like, like my engineering is good enough to offer as a service. Like I can sell people beats cause I have so many beats on my laptop that I'm not even going to use. Right. Like, and I'm like, why would I let these go to waste? Cause like, I, I like the beats. Right. And it's like, it's just about finding a placement for them yeah. or finding someone to give them to or yeah. whatever that comes down to. Yeah. And for me, yeah, I was working at uh, Shopify for two and a half years, which is like a tech company and amazing, amazing experience. Like I wouldn't know half of the things that I know now, obviously without it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it had its purpose for sure. But for me, I actually wrote it on a board even before I started Shopify. Like when I initially got the job offer, I told AP, I'm like, yo, I'm gonna quit this job when I hit a threshold. The problem is I didn't define what that threshold was. And it came <laughs> <laughs> as, as often, you know, happens, but it came to a point um, probably like one year ago now, or like maybe like last April or something like that. After we had our first show where I started to sort of see enough momentum that I could see like, yo, time is going to be my most valuable asset right now to 10 X this thing. And what I realized is like the money because of my broad skill sets can be acquired in other ways, but me being cuffed down to a nine to five and having that very defined time schedule and the switching costs of having to consistently context switch, like go from like business development and partnerships to like music was just mentally exhausting, right? Because they're two different minds you have to work. And I, I decided, and I had like a, I built like a five month exit plan. Like I didn't go like, I'm gonna quit my job and quit my job. I think that's something really important to just note real quick. Have a strategy. Yeah. I didn't just do it overnight. I told these guys, I told the team. And then I was like, I'm gonna build this out over the next four or five months. I did it properly. Like I saved up enough money, sold my stocks, all that. And then got to a point also where I was able to make money in other ways. And that's where I'm at now is music. Uh, like Karolanka doesn't necessarily, it's not at the point where it's on a month to month basis sustaining my income. But obviously like with the show and everything, we have like money in our bank account that we're now reinvesting, which is great. And then the other thing is like, I take consulting calls and things that basically pay just as much in a lot of ways on a per hour basis, but take a lot less mental exhaustion. And mm -hmm. also like the amount of switching costs, like me having to like edit a video in premiere and then go take like a business development call for like four hours. That's not happening anymore, which is like super important. Yeah. But it, it took a lot of reflection, honestly, to get to that point. So switching costs is huge, man. I, I think people undervalue the, uh, the, 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 the dissipation of energy when you're yeah. doing all these different things. And that's why I always, you know, I push against diversity in a way sometimes that people understand. It's not that I don't say, I don't 
want people to be diverse at the end, but just understanding splitting your efforts when you have very little to work with and you're trying to cut through at this moment, right? The point of a nail is concentrated for a reason. Mm -hmm. You have to focus, right? And I think that you guys are doing that. It's why you guys have been able to have the results you have because you, there's no way you would have been able to do it otherwise, right? Like not working your job. I'm not telling everybody they need to quit their job now. And I think most people though also face, need to face the reality that it's not even if they weren't working their job some people just don't have the work ethic so some people don't have a job and they're still not putting in the level of effort or they just think i'm done this is enough and it's almost stressful and anxiety inducing the level of work that you have to put in in those moments all right so yeah. I, I it's almost like you know what it is it's like if you couldn't like like for us we knocked down that first domino with the first show right if i was if, if we weren't able to sell out an 80 person venue and then a 120 person like sort of show with me working my job I wouldn't have quit my job because then that's at the point where I realized like okay now to go to a 250 we need to put in twice the effort and I'm like I'm running myself very thin right now in terms of like mind space and everything I'm at the edge right now in terms of operating capacity so how can I like create more capacity and 100% like we would not have been able to do that like 250 person show if it wasn't for like honestly like if I'm being real like 12 14 hour days like on end you know of yeah. just like ticket sales, rehearsals, like everything. Uh, you need to realize- and Content, like- the, uh, Content, all that, yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly, because doing this shit is multiple jobs already. For real. Right? For real. So to be doing the multiple jobs within this, which is hard enough, and you really need to find the most important priorities within that to focus in, and then you add an entire job on top of that, right? It, it, it becomes a lot, it is a lot, so, that's why it looks, if you're working a job, I'll just say this generally speaking, you can't figure, you can't work all of those things going on in music. You need to pick the top priorities. And then when you're ready, you need to understand how to take on all those things. So I'll end it with this because you talk about all that work. Y'all put in 14 hours, um, days at certain times. Y'all quit y'all's jobs, all those things. What does your actual team look like for context as well? On top of all the stuff we talked about. Yeah, so yeah. it's purely just it's it's us two, obviously, and then we have uh we have one um, manager Cheyenne who works on um like just sort of day to day stuff, strategy, 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 like strategy and whatnot. Sure. And we just recently brought on a homie Muzzy who's now helping us out with just researching on like festivals and like taking on more of like a booking agent role. So that's very early now, but essentially his role now is like, how can we get booked in other places? Like um, sort of like whether it's festivals or like other opportunities and almost like a business manager kind of thing. Also, how can we reinvest the money? Um, but it took a while to obviously be able to expand it. It took a lot of like everyone wearing multiple hats and it's still, it still is that right. Everyone has to work like five to six jobs at once, even with our team right now. But yeah, I'll but be right. Like, even with like having like those two extra people on top of us, it's like, we can already start to delegate a few tasks to people like, to like someone who's like, like Rohan's like great at the video editing. So it's like, yo, you just do that. Like, cause you're really good at it. And you right? do the engineering. And I'll just trust you. Like, and when just show me the end result and I'll be like, yes, or like maybe let's fix this. Right. Um, but just like, just that getting a few things off your mind so you can really focus in on the things that each yeah. person in the team is good at. Huge. But that being said, I'll say there's one thing Will Smith said recently in an interview, which like really resonated with me is like, no one is going to join your team or like hop on board until you are so fucking crazy like with your own self-belief and capacity that they're like all right something's happening here you know what i'm saying so like ap and i had to like for sure do so much by ourselves for like these guys to even be like express an interest in working with us um, and obviously we're blessed now to be in that position but it takes a lot of elbow grease in the early days and we're still in the early uh, days yeah, still in the early yeah, days yeah, man so. that's what's up man that's what's up man you, you get moving and then people will hop on the bandwagon everybody wants yeah, to move exactly Sure. Well, hey, tell everybody where to follow you guys. Where's the most important page to follow? Yeah, it's uh, Karolanka, K-E-R-A-L-A-N-K-A -A -A -A, on YouTube, Instagram, Spotify, all the above. We're on TikTok, TikTok. now. We're posting like five <laughs> times a day on TikTok. So TikTok, please, Karolanka, K-E-R-A-L-A-N-K-A -A -A -A, everywhere. So yeah, y'all see it right there. Y'all yeah. see it right there. We got, we got the corn emoji. You already know. We got the corny skits. 
y'all want to understand what the Karolanka universe is, we have some of our homies playing characters. So people who come to our show are in love with these characters too. That's part of part of what this whole experience is about. So dope. check us out. Dope. I love it, man. Appreciate you guys again. Yo, everybody, this is yet another link up. If you like this video, go ahead to like button. If you like, you might as well share it. And if you're not subscribed, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button. It's the network.